I'm going to tell you guys yet another traumatizing story from my past. I was around 14, and it had to be around like 9 at night, so while I probably should have been getting ready for bed in my parents' eyes, I was actually just perusing Netflix and any other streaming platform we had at the time, going through all the horror movies to see if one catches my eye and I could have a good scare before I went to bed. Normally these journeys down the horror catalog don't lead me anywhere that exciting. Most of the time I just end up spending an hour trying to find something and I end up just going to bed without watching anything anyways. Sad and defeated. But this time was different. See, this time there was a movie shining from within called VHS. If I remember correctly, the only reason I ended up clicking the movie is because I had a hunch that this specific image was from this movie, as I had stumbled upon this image a couple times before just as a scary image online. Little did I know that within 28 minutes of the movie, I would have to text my friend asking them to watch it with me as I wasn't sure I was going to be able to face it alone. You wouldn't believe it, but at the same 28 minute mark, we both were startled once more. For those who aren't aware, it isn't just this movie, but as of now there have been 5 total VHS films over the last 10 years. From 2012 to 2014, VHS 1, 2, and Viral dropped yearly before seeing a 6 year hiatus until VHS 94 was announced to reboot the franchise. There seems to be a disagreement on whether or not 94 is actually a reboot since these movies didn't really connect all that much anyway, so what's the point in calling it that? VHS 94 ended up releasing on Shudder and wouldn't you know it, it was a record breaking premiere on the platform. That record was then broken the following year with the release of VHS 99. And as of right now, we are expected to see the 6th film in the franchise, VHS 85 coming out sometime this year. These movies basically follow each other beat for beat. It's found footage horror, and there is a plot surrounding these VHS tapes that when watched by the viewer, starts to make them go absolutely crazy. We the audience watch these tapes alongside the person watching in some movies, and in other movies we just kind of flash to a tape and then flash to the outside story. Most movies consist of 5 tapes, except for this trash. So each movie is a collection of horror shorts sprinkled around a larger story happening in the background. It's a neat concept and allows smaller directors to really show off some skill. Some of these directors went on to direct some of my new favorite horror films. But as with every other movie franchise, there are its highs and its lows, and I wanted to go over tapes that I think really set the bar. And I'm going to try and have one example for each movie, which for some that's going to be a little difficult. Before we get too far, just wanted to say if you found yourself enjoying what you're seeing, be sure to hit all those neat buttons down below as it truly helps us out, and be sure to check out our social links in the description. Alright, now you can pass through. Our first tape comes from the latest installment, VHS 99, and is called Ozzy's Dungeon. VHS 99 is probably a lower tier VHS movie for me, but this tape I thought was a fun time and it didn't fall into the trap of the acting not being very good and the tape feeling like it's dragging. This tape begins on the intro to an episode of Ozzy's Dungeon, which appears to be a fun little game show for kids to go on and compete for getting their favorite wish granted. Definitely sounds legit. Wait, is that is that who I think it is? I gotta fuck someone. My daddy was not nice to me! This tape just got a hundred times more enticing to watch just because I know that the movie's antics and his are going to combine just nicely. We see the first challenge of the game, and it looks like these kids are just throwing themselves into each other, trying to pop the balloon strap to the other's chest. We quickly cut over to a segment where Trevor asks each kid what their wish would be. I want to be the most famous and best basketball player. It'll be alright, folks. That's what makes Ozzy's Dungeon dungeony. The first eight team doesn't seem to be very good at their job, I gotta say. The next game is the kids having to try and catch a big turkey leg in their mouth. These games seem to lead to a lot of beat up kids. Donna from the yellow team seems to have succeeded in catching the turkey leg and wins the second game. She gets interviewed by Trevor and he tries to warn her how difficult this next challenge will be, telling her that no one has beaten it yet. But Trevor has a feeling. And that feeling starts down in my feet and it goes higher and higher and it rises higher and higher. Does anybody else have that feeling? Oh! Donna says that she can do anything she puts her mind to and that's why she will win. When asked what her wish would be, we cut out to something else. We then finally get to our final challenge. Donna's family watches from the audience as these two contestants get ready. Trevor shows off the obstacle course. It's basically this digestive system that they have to crawl through. All they have to do is make it to the end to meet Ozzy and get that wish granted. A minute on the clock is set and the kids are on their way through. Donna starts flying through the course. She's on an excellent start. Right before she makes it out of the intestines, she's pushed by the other kid and her leg snaps backwards and it is quite a gruesome sight and Trevor is not helping in the slightest. The game doesn't even stop, and the other kid wins. 
We zoom out to reveal we have been watching a rerun episode in this hidden garage with Donna's family, and they have Trevor trapped in a dog cage. They are out for some revenge for what happened to their daughter. In this garage, they have recreated the digestive obstacle course and they plan to have Trevor go through it. We see that Donna has been permanently crippled, and when we see her leg, it looks like it has been completely rotted and still intact. I don't know why it wasn't amputated, but I also have many other questions. Deborah has what I guess is hydrochloric acid in a spray bottle and uses it as a means to make Trevor make his way through their remake of his obstacle course. But before he gets set on the course, the son puts a helmet on with knives taped to the top and he runs head first into Trevor's sides. Then he is made to try and catch what looks like some nasty meat in his mouth. All the games are being used against him and ugh, it's, it's gross. It is now time for him to go through his obstacle course. Deborah shows off the obstacle course and then he is set off to try and go through it. He slides and slips around the course, and as he comes out yelling that he made it on time, Deborah reveals that he actually didn't, and he has failed to complete the track on time. As a last ditch effort to save himself, he says he can still take Donna to the dungeon to get her wish. I can help get a wish granted. I can help you. Are you fucking with me right no. now? Deborah agrees, and they are all off back to the studio to get the wish. We see armed guards in front of the studio, and Trevor mentions that security has gotten beefier last he saw. Trevor looks around at the old stage before knocking on a giant door, to which the lady we saw in the series comes out and gives Trevor the torch. Everyone starts to head through the cave. Trevor tells Deborah he had actually never been this far into the cave, to the point where he didn't even know it was a real cave. I've never been past the door before. Oh my god. Damn it. They go further and further into the tunnel before what appears to be a ghost kid walks on through past them. Trevor takes Donna's wheelchair and starts to make their way towards Ozzy who is revealed to be this incredibly large monster lady laying on a bed, to which Donna leans in and makes her wish. A loud groan starts to come out of Ozzy, and everyone looks around confused. Like straight out of the thing, a big alien creature shoots out of the stomach of Ozzy with tentacles flying everywhere. Everyone's faces start melting off as lightning zaps all around before the camera's last frame freezes on Donna smiling at the camera. I chose this tape from VHS 99 because it had a good blend of that campy horror with some actually disturbing scenes. The design for Ozzy at the very end as well is a really cool practical design. It doesn't sit with the really high tier VHS tapes, but it definitely is one that I believe holds good faith to the VHS name and deserves its spot amongst the movie's better set of tapes. I feel like the acting was believable from all parties. The leg snap scene is also really graphic and painful to watch, and all around, the tape is uncomfortable to watch. But to counteract all the nasty, we have Trevor, who manages to fit in this world pretty well. When I first saw him, I was worried he would stand out too much, but no, he did great and I feel the tape benefited with him in it. The actor who plays Deborah was also a really menacing threat and I constantly was unsure what her next course of action was going to be. Next up, we have Dante the Great from VHS Viral. Trust me, this tape is pretty goofy, but it also embraces how silly it gets, which makes it a bit of a fun watch. Unfortunately, out of the three tapes, yeah, you heard right, Viral only has three tapes, and this is the only one that's worth a watch, I'd say. It makes sense why the hiatus was so long now. But anyways, this tape is the one that I got the most enjoyment out of. We are taken into what appears to be a documentary on a magician known as Dante the Great. In the beginning, he wasn't so great, however, and his magic kinda sucked. No one takes any of his tricks seriously until he gets his hands on this magician's cloak. People said that his life changed forever after he got his hands on this cloak. Well, said cloak was allowing Dante to perform actual magic. He picked my pocket. From mid balcony, he picked my pocket. From the stage. I don't know how he did it. At seven o'clock in New York, we walk out of the doors. We're in LA. We're in LA. I'm <laughs> No one was able to discover how he was pulling these tricks off. This made Dante one of the most popular magicians to exist. You had to know someone to get into one of his shows. We see, however, that Dante has been using his magic for some more nefarious reasons, whether it be the cloak's influence or just Dante. It appears, however, that the cloak doesn't work at all times. It needs to be fed. Unfortunately, the only thing it wants to eat is people, so we get to watch as Dante gives the cloak exactly what it wants. We are introduced to his new assistant, Scarlet, who Dante pretty quickly garners a liking towards. He tries to ask her out for dinner, except she turns him down as she is already with someone else. It's not like her current boyfriend is any better as he assaults her outside the building before walking off. Dante goes outside to comfort her, but this boyfriend is next on his list. Dante is able to bring this boyfriend to his little area before absolutely wrecking him with his magic. 
Scarlet starts to get suspicious and discovers his camera, which has footage of every murder he and his cape had committed. She takes it to authorities, and the SWAT team begins to arrive at his studio. However, during Scarlet's interview with detectives, she is taken out of thin air and brought to where Dante is. He begins to confront her, but the SWAT team shows up ready to take action. Except they don't end up faring too well against straight up magic, and they get completely destroyed. It turns out the only person with the ability to beat Dante would be Scarlet, who puts the cloak on herself to get the upper hand. See, this is where I get a little confused, because there's a scene earlier where Dante is teaching Scarlet how to magically tie his hands in a knot, and she does so without the cape on. So is magic just real, and the cloak shows you how to use it, or is the cloak the source of magic? I'm not too sure, but this movie isn't really good enough for me to think too seriously about it, especially after the scene we are met with next. We get a big magic action scene, which in all honesty, has some pretty good wire effects that actually looked pretty cool. While all these effects are on screen, I can't help but think, however, who is filming this? You could say it's the documentary crew, but come on, I, I wasn't born yesterday. Something that makes all the tapes really good is that they are convincingly found footage. This one seems to not even give the found footage part a second thought, and was just trying to show off some stunt work. I'm not too sure what the thought process was, but that was just a part of the tape that bugged me. It appears Dante gets the upper hand and begins to command his cape to go and eat Scarlet. Except it appears Scarlet is in control and commands the cape to eat Dante instead. She takes the cloak and sets it on fire to get rid of it for good. Not all is over yet. While she is at home, her closet door creeps open. Once she checks things out, it appears the cloak has found its way back to her. But pretty quickly, two large hands comes out of the cloak and grab her before the tape ends. It's no secret that VHS Viral is the least liked among the movies. And I would say rightfully so. The movie only has three tapes in total, and the premise overall is pretty lame. Dante the Great at least seemed to reach new heights and explore a territory not yet seen in the franchise, and you gotta respect it for that at least. I think the story could have been a bit more polished up as the way the magic works is still a little confusing, which to me makes the climax not as exciting since I don't really know what's happening. Next tape we have is Safe Haven from VHS 2, arguably the best VHS movie of the bunch. VHS 2 only has four tapes, and I believe that's because this third tape was given extra screen time because this tape is long and well worth it too. The tape has us following a film crew interviewing a man talking about how he and his sons and daughters are close to achieving a higher plane of existence, a place they call paradise. Moving to discuss further, the camera crew convince him to take them to Paradise Gates to get a better look at what exactly is going on. We cut through security footage of the area, and we are quickly met with weird imagery. We see a classroom with children all singing together, a room with a couple women that looks like a sacrificial room, and then the guy we were talking to previously with what looks like a knife he is taking to his stomach. Some weird shit. We learn the guy taking the knife to himself is referred to as Father, and is described as the sole shepherd in their journey to immortality. A young girl named Lydia gives the film's producer, Lena, a little necklace that is probably not cursed at all or anything. She quickly takes it off and calls it creepy, which is probably a good call. No, this is creepy, man. I don't know where this... They are led downstairs as things start to appear more and more cult-like, and so we can only fear what is bound to happen here. We are shown a room specific to Father's Chosen Little Ones, which is the classroom of the kids singing. The lady giving them the tour doesn't seem to like them mentioning the fact that they also have security cameras everywhere. After the creepy walkthrough, we begin to set up the interview with Father himself. Before anything can start, it appears Lena is a little sick and is about to throw up and excuses herself. Adam decides to leave the interview as well to go check on her. The interview starts and he begins to ask Father what he thinks from an outside perspective and his relationship with all the children before we cut to Lena, walking around and finding herself in the classroom. She compliments all the drawings before the teacher comes in and starts to say some pretty strange things, commenting about how her child will be more beautiful than all the others. Lena runs out with Adam and seems to be very distressed. Cutting back to the interview, it appears the goal is to press Father into admitting everything is a cult and that they are inappropriately using all these children. This just leads the father to go on a big paradise rant before our man interviewing needs to run out and do a battery change, leaving our sound guy to sit in his place. Once at the car to get the spare battery, he overhears through the external monitor that follows Adam who is talking to Lena. What he hears is Lena confessing that she is pregnant and the baby is Adam's and not his, which is a problem considering that Lena and Malik are married. Adam wants to keep things secret where Lena wants to tell him. She tells Adam to fuck off and goes to tell him herself. 
Back in the interview room, we hear a loud chime start to go off. As the sound guy tries to start asking questions, Father gets on the intercom and starts to say they are approaching the final steps and that today they will reach their salvation. Adam begins to explore and finds himself in a room with a bloody sheet covering an area while Lena walks near the classroom. Sound guy unfortunately interrupts the announcement and Father threatens him with a box cutter. Adam continues through the bloody sheets to find what looks like a corpse sitting on a bench covered in a white bloody towel. He oddly goes to pull the sheet off the person's face to reveal that of a dead woman. Turns out she is not dead, and she sprangles around revealing a big open pregnant stomach as she flails around, causing Adam to run out. Father starts to unbutton his shirt to reveal markings cut out on his stomach. He jumps on the table with the box cutter and attacks the sound guy, managing to cut his throat. Sound guy did nothing wrong, but was unfortunately killed. Father says the time is now, before we see all the kids in the classroom with their cups, with what we can only assume to be some type of poison, before a group of women and the teacher approach Lena from the classroom. Adam runs through the building, and we see the classroom full of the now dead children. Malik runs back inside to see all the members put guns to their heads before ending themselves. A fight breaks out between Malik and a guy with a shotgun. He gets the upper hand and wins the fight. Even though he is now equipped with a shotgun, he still gets apprehended and lined up with others to be shot. Adam runs in right before he is next and tries to save him, but it is too late, and we see Malik end up like the rest. Guy just finds out his fiance cheated on him with his best friend before getting shot himself. The guy who shot Malik then shoots himself, and Adam is left by himself. We cut to Lena being taken away by a group of girls being led by father. They shut the door behind themselves as Adam gets ready to save her. He grabs a pipe and starts to make his way to the door before all of a sudden an explosion comes from behind the doors. Adam is flung back and we see a frightening demon from hell crawl across the ceiling, and father walks out of the room covered in blood. He says it's been fulfilled before he explodes from the inside. Adam continues inside and starts to rip the evil hands off of Lena who lays helpless on the table. After freeing her, Adam tries to pull her up but she is forced back down by an unknown force. Adam shows her stomach to see something big is crawling around inside, trying to get out. A spike bursts out of her stomach as what can only be described as a giant horned demon crawls out of her. Adam runs through the building and makes his way out. It appears however that everyone who was killed has come back as mindless zombies as he tries to make his way out. We see crazy shit after crazy shit around every corner. After facing off all the zombies, Adam makes his way to the car and manages to take off. The demon is much faster than this car as it catches up and rams itself into the side, causing the car to flip off the road. Adam wakes up and manages to slowly crawl semi out of the car before realizing that the demon stands directly above him before calling him Papa. Adam laughs hysterically before the tape cuts out and ends. I absolutely love this tape with all my heart. Everything about it was just so well executed. This tape had believable character drama. It had a believable setting and premise. The fact that it's a documentary camera crew makes the found footage part believable as well. And best of all, this tape is really scary. I hate when things crawl around on ceilings and walls, so when Adam sees the one thing crawling around, I was already checked out. Also, the prosthetic makeup in this tape is off the charts. The demon crawling out of Lena's stomach is one of the most vile scenes I've had to witness. I don't even think I could show a lot of this tape on YouTube with how bloody and violent it is. This tape shows all the reasons why I love this franchise. We are able to see what these directors can do with these lower budgets, and it's mind-blowing. This tape is definitely one of the top tier tapes in the VHS franchise, and we got two more that I think could potentially be even better. Coming up next, we are going to be looking at Sewer Drain from VHS 94, and oh boy do I really love this tape. We start on Channel 6 News, where the report says that many people are coming forward with a story about a mysterious figure everyone is calling the Rat Man, said to live in the sewer and vanish at the sight of light. We follow Holly, a reporter for Channel 6, going around interviewing multiple eyewitnesses and getting more information on this rat man. So tell me, where did you first see him? Right there. Behind me. That's where I saw him. Right there. After getting orders from the station, they are told to go further into the drain and get even more footage. After attempting an intro, Holly and the cameraman Jeff keep hearing noises further into the drain. Jeff sees another person through the camera and walks deeper into the sewer to try and see who it is. It turns out to just be a homeless guy's little sleeping area. Holly gets the idea that there are potentially homeless kids along with others that live in these sewers. She gets the idea that instead of filming the rat man, they should talk about the homeless population that have to live in these conditions. Holly goes in deeper and has Jeff follow so they can get more footage. Don't you want to do something that will make a difference, Jeff? That will like, I don't know, help people? 
The further they go, the more footage they are able to get, until Holly stops at a corner after finding someone lurking around. Jeff gets a little spooked by something in the tent, but after collecting themselves, carry on further to interview a pretty freaky looking homeless guy named Bill. When she asks if anyone else lives down here with him, his only answer is Ratma. Before he looks at her, and either blood or gross mud starts coming out of his mouth. Obviously spooked, Holly and Jeff start to make their way back. It turns into a full-on sprint after various monster noises are heard from around. Jeff loses Holly, and when you think he will run back to save her, he says fuck this and runs the other direction. Too bad someone was anticipating this move and was there to stop him. Holly wakes up to find the sewer homeless population surrounding her with the camera as she tries to convince them that the people above can help them out and that she is actually doing her news story on them. There are people that can help you. That can get you on your feet. Okay? From the darkness, a religious guy they had interviewed earlier comes out and tells her that they are going to tell their own story, and summons the rat man to come out from the dark tunnel. Sure enough, a giant rat creature crawls his way out. The religious guy gets a cup of the rat's saliva and pours it over cameraman Jeff, and it appears to melt his face off. He explains to Holly that only the righteous will rise and Jeff wasn't worthy, but it's possible Holly will be saved. She is pulled towards the rat man, and we see as she gets the saliva dump right from the source as she screams while it dumps all over her. We flicker out and view an infomercial for the Veggie Masher, which looks pretty barbaric, but not long we cut back to Channel 6 News where they talk about the return of Holly after getting trapped in a storm drain. Holly was able to make it out of the sewers and come back to work. Everyone congratulates her return as she starts to tell the next news story about the pumpkin festival. Except she reads it a little weird. People are already lining up to Ratma the Hay Rides, Apple Ratma, and of course, to see who will be crowned the festival's largest Ratma. To our shock, she throws up over her coworker's face, and just like the rats, it's quite acidic as his face immediately melts off live on TV. She finishes up her story, and our tape ends. It is possible that this tape is my favorite from the VHS series, as everything about it works so perfectly. It is a bit of a slower pace, but the world building and mystery was so interesting to follow. A news crew through the sewers looking for a large Ratman hybrid is pretty scary. The scene when Jeff turns and the person is right there waiting to grab him makes me jump every time. What's also nice is this tape really seemed to nail the ending, which a lot of these tapes have a hard time doing. It seems because, I don't know if it's just me, but a lot of tape endings are mostly abrupt and feel kind of like a cheap cutaway ending, but this one felt like it wrapped this short horror story up perfectly. When I saw this tape was the one to start off VHS 94, I was very hopeful to watch the rest because the series seems to be in decent hands. However, it seems like it's time to talk about the tape that started it all, Amateur Night from VHS 1. This tape begins and we find out we are seeing through the lenses of these camera glasses. We quickly learn the intention behind having a camera hidden in the glasses, and that is to bring women back over to the motel to fool around and to have it filmed. Apparently, he lifts his shot glass up to his forehead when he drinks. The three find themselves bar hopping, trying to find people to bring back. It looks like our super Christian nice guy Shane has found someone ready to go. But it looks like someone took it upon themselves to approach our glasses wearer Clint. The only thing this odd appearing lady can seem to say is I like you as she stares directly into his soul. Because these guys are all insane drunk hooligans, they pretty quickly get kicked out of the bar they are in and decide it is time to make their way back to the motel with their partners. Rachel who is with Shane and then the I like you lady who sits awkwardly in the car. Her odd behavior is justified by everybody else that she is just really drugged up and that's why she is acting this way. They all get themselves settled down at the motel before Shane attempts to start making his move on Rachel. Unfortunately for him, she has had way too much to drink and eventually just passes out on the bed. Shane tries to wake her up, but surprisingly Patrick tells him that she's passed out and he is shit out of luck and he keeps him from probably going further. What? She's done, dude. She's done. Don't do it. Stop now. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. Clint and his lady begin to have their own conversation before she makes it very clear she does not like Patrick. <laughs> Since lady number one failed with Shane, he immediately moves on to try with the girl Clint had brought over, interrupting the talk they were previously having. 
Clint is initially jealous, but it seems he is also welcome to join Shane and the Odd Lady. Shane completely disrobes her, and we see that her feet look very creature-like. She also makes strange sounds during the act. Something is definitely not right with this lady. Now Patrick is getting jealous and wants in on the action, but she absolutely does not want Patrick involved. Clint seems to get weirded out and runs off into the bathroom to collect his thoughts, before Patrick throws himself into the bathroom to show off he has a huge bite mark on his hand from her. Patrick goes to confront her before she turns, and her head is completely split open, and she screams before Patrick and Clint fly back, and she starts to completely shred up Shane. Clint and Patrick try to come up with a game plan in the bathroom to attack her. Patrick grabs a shower rod and is going to attempt to use it as a weapon. They both run outside and see that she has finished her job with Shane, and was waiting for the other two to come out. Patrick runs in to attack, but it fails miserably and he gets jumped on. Clint tries to wake up Rachel, but she is still so passed out. But I feel like Rachel isn't going to get messed with. As Patrick is getting ripped up, Clint runs and tries to make his way to the front door. He climbs over Shane's dead body before he peeks around the bed to assess the situation. Turns out the situation is really bad because Patrick is completely dead and he got his junk ripped off by the demon lady. This movie definitely doesn't hold back, so I was in quite the shock when I was seeing all this for the first time. Clint musters up the courage to crawl further towards the door and makes his way out. He runs through the complex and sprints down the stairs. Turns out, sprinting downstairs is never a good idea as he falls down and breaks his wrist. Remember that moment I said cause me to phone a friend? <laughs> He lays helplessly on the ground as she climbs closer towards him. She begins to give him some of that good demon action, but my dude does not seem at all into it. This upsets her, and it appears as if she cowers away in shame, upset that he wasn't a fan of her pleasure. As her screams grow louder, Clint manages to escape and make a break for it. He tries to get help from the other residents, but to be fair, who is going to let this guy who sounds crazy into their motel? He runs towards a truck with a bunch of guys who see what we can't, as Clint gets lifted off the ground and straight into the air. Turns out our demon lady was actually a succubus. She sprouted her wings and took off with him, with her claws digging into his side. His camera glasses fall to the ground, and Clint is taken away. I have a hard time deciding on whether or not Amateur Night or Sewer Drain is my favorite tape. Amateur Night might just hold some nostalgia factor because I remember being super scared of it when I first saw it. It was mostly the makeup on the succubus that really sells it, and the fact that seeing her head on doesn't take away any of the scare is really an achievement. Most of the time, the design of the monster is just never as scary as the build-up towards it, but with this movie, it felt like every time she was on camera, I was unnerved and didn't want to look. I feel like this encapsulates the absolute insanity that you get when you go into these VHS films. It really appears that these directors are given just free reign to make whatever they can come up with, and it's cool to see all that they are able to do. Granted, I feel that none of the other movies have managed to come close to the first two when it comes to the tape selection as a whole, but it's nice that every movie at least has one tape that stands out above the rest, instead of the whole movie being a compilation of poorly made tapes. I will definitely be on the lookout for the next installment, VHS 85, since it's been confirmed Scott Derrickson and David Bruckner who did Amateur Night, so I'm super stoked to see what they can come up with. I definitely would like to hear what VHS tapes are your standouts down below. Trust me, I love a lot of the other tapes, but for this video I decided I would just pick one per movie just to give them all a chance to shine. Be sure to check these films out if you haven't, and be ready to lose a couple hours of sleep when you do.